All right, it is 5.03, so I'll go ahead and start with a welcome. Uh, John Paul, I have started recording. Thank you all for being here for our first meeting of the Social Studies Standards Advisory Committee for the DC State Board of Education. My name is Jessica Sutter. I represent Ward 6 on the DC State Board of Education, and I'm the chairperson of our board's Social Studies Standards Committee. And I'm incredibly grateful to the 26 of you who applied to volunteer your time, your expertise, your knowledge, your passion for the social studies in helping our state, uh, wishful thinking though it may be, our state, go ahead and design the right set of learning standards for all of our students in grades pre-K three through 12. Uh, tonight is our first meeting. We're going to have six monthly meetings during the rest of the calendar year for 2020. And we'll have meetings over the next 18 months or so after that to continue the work of following the social studies standards as they develop in partnership with our partners at OSSI. And I'm very thankful to have a representative from OSSI here. Um, two other things I want to say before we go around and do some introductions. Uh, I really appreciate that a number of people who applied for the advisory committee. We had 104 applicants. We had hoped to have about 15 people. We weren't able to get any narrower than the 26 incredibly talented individuals we chose. Uh, but I really, I really am impressed with the talent pool that we had. During our board working session last week, I mentioned that all of your applications were available for review on our state board website, but I misspoke and I wanted to correct that at the top. We are de-identifying those applications from your personal uh, contact information but your applications along with your name, your role, et cetera, are all public on the website. So I did wanna correct that publicly for folks. That was part of the disclosure that folks signed when they applied. And so all of that is available on the state board's website. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen here and bear with me as I get to be host. I wanna make sure I can still see some. So can you all see the slideshow version now? Looks like it, okay, fantastic. So we'll go ahead and get started. Our agenda for the night looks like this. We have two hours together. We'll start with some introductions, talk through some meeting norms, dive into a discussion of what our work together will look like, and then we'll talk a little bit about learning standards, uh, what DC has in the way of standards, and we'll end with some next steps for our meetings. Tonight, there's probably a little more content generated by the board. I hope in the future we we'll have far less content gen generated for you all, much more content generated 
by the members of this committee. We have two objectives for tonight. These are the same objectives on the agenda you received. Uh, I won't read them to you, but we'll use this meeting really as a means of introducing ourselves to one another, setting some expectations for our time together, uh, and then making sure that we all understand the work of standards revision, what it's looked like in other states, uh, and that how other states have engaged the public. I'd like to start with you some introductions, your name, your ward, either where you live or where you work or both, if you both live and work in the district, uh, your roles, that can be your professional role, also your community role, and any other roles you hold that make you drawn to this work. So I know that some of you are educators, but you're also parents. So please share with us all the roles that you claim that make this work close and important to you. And then one sentence on why the standards revision work matters to you. I'm going to put up a roster in a moment of all the folks who are part of the advisory panel and I'm going to suggest that we go in that alphabetical order. It's alphabetical by first name so that we don't have to figure out who's going next. Um, I also want to make sure that anyone on the phone who is not part of the advisory committee will take care of introductions at the conclusion of the last person. So I want to make sure that uh, our representative from OSI, my colleague from the state board, uh, all also add their introductions once we hear from our last advisory committee member. We're going to go ahead and start with Mr. O'Sullivan. Please unmute yourself to speak. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Alex O'Sullivan, and um, I live in Ward 6, but I go to school in Ward 2 at Basis DC High School. Um, and I guess this will be my second year as a student representative on the State Board of Education and I'm a rising junior at BASIS, and this work is important for me because we feel the impact that Eurocentric um, education has on historically oppressed and marginalized communities, um, and when we fail to accurately portray the painful histories and truths um, of the world in the past and present, we continue to fail the people affected by um, these mistruths, and we contribute to their institutional oppression. So I think it's really important that we um, justly and accurately portray what's happened in the world and what happens today. Thank you, Alex. Has Alyssa joined us? Okay, I'm going to hand it off to Barbara. And if Alyssa joins us, we'll come back. Hi, everyone. My name is Barbara Davidson, and I run an organization called Standards Work, which also uh, manages something called the Knowledge Matters Campaign. Standards Work was actually the firm that helped to facilitate the development of the current <laughs> existing uh, DC Social Studies Standards back in 2005, 2006, when uh, we were helping to lead the development of rigorous academic standards in, in each of the content areas. So I don't know if everybody knows that DC standards are, were at the time rated among the best uh, in the nation. And um, But that is not my purpose in being here now. Um, I, I obviously think that uh, standards are, are, are it's probably high time that they be uh, looked at and, and revised. Um, so my interest is, is uh, I, I'm a huge proponent of the importance of background knowledge and, and, and um, history and geography and the other social uh, studies uh, as well. And, um, and, you know, just feel very privileged to be a part of helping to uh, look at how they can be improved and even better serve the needs of the district um, going forward. Thank you, Barbara. And I hand it to Daniel. Hi everyone, my name is Daniel Spinas. I'm a special education teacher um, in Ward 1. I also live in Ward 1. Um, my interest in the standards, uh, to kind of build off of what Barbara said, um, I'm a big proponent of um, knowledge building instruction, and too often I feel that students with disabilities are deprived of opportunities to build knowledge, particularly about um, history. Um, and I also feel it's very important that they're represented in um, history standards. So those are my primary interest. Wonderful. Welcome, Daniel. I'm going to hand it to Elizabeth. Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here. Um, this is really exciting. I live in Ward 4. I'm also a parent of two students in Ward 4. Um, I'm an associate professor at American University 
that's in Ward 3, I think. Um, and I wanted to be part of this group um, because I've been studying civic education around the globe for almost two decades now and want to share some of what I've learned um, from what other countries are doing in other places to create active citizens. And I think there's never been a more important time to ensure that DCPS students are educated to be active, anti-racist, and critical citizens, both of our local community, our national community, and of our global community. I'm looking forward to the next year and a half. Wonderful, so happy to have you. Thank you. Emily. Hi, my name is Emily Brimsek. Um, I live in Ward 5 and I work in Ward 2. I'm the manager of professional learning programs at the National Center on Education and the Economy, which is um, a policy organization here that would do a lot of work around the country. Uh, a component of my work there is supporting teachers and school leaders in rethinking approaches to history and social studies education um, and assessment as well. Um, and so this work is important to me, one, because I live in DC, I'm excited to, you know, bring some of that work to where I live. Um, I also think that, you know, effective history and social studies programs are uniquely positioned to support students in developing global awareness, digital literacy, and critical thinking skills, all the things that I think, you know, you can take with you from K-12 into whatever you do. Tremendous. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, Mr. Moore. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Thadal Moore. I am a uh, native of Southeast DC. Um, currently leaving Silver Spring, but taught in Ward 4 and currently go to school in Ward 2. Um, I'm a former DC, um, DC Social Studies middle, middle School Social Studies teacher and a former DCPS student myself. I'm currently I'm a court fellow at Georgetown University, which um, is essentially a scholarship allowing me to learn more about how to use public policy as a lever to create a more equitable um, education system. Um, my, my goal basically is to make sure that like our our form of schooling here in DC and throughout the country is something that will actually be more of a, le a lever to um, rectify injustices that will help students who grew up like I did. Um, this work is very important to me because I always told my students that you don't become a citizen at 18. Empathetic citizenship is something that needs to be taught. Um, and I'm very, very excited to see what we can do to make sure it's happening in all of our classrooms. Awesome. Thank you so much, Fidal. Uh, next, Jennifer. Hi everyone, um, I am Jennifer DePauli. I am a Ward 2 resident and I am a senior researcher at the Learning Policy Institute. We conduct research uh, and translate that over into policy action. Um, I am a former social studies teacher in the middle grades myself, fifth and seventh. Um, and so that drew me to this. Um, and I have totally wholeheartedly agree with what everybody has said. And I will just add that I hope um, that there can be some more uh, a level of student agency put into history learning um, and to break up the disconnects between the past and the present um, so that students can actually learn more about kind of what the impact of what's happening now has had its roots in our past. Um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Jessica. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jessica Rucker. I'm a high school teacher, um, as well as a DC public schools graduate. I was born and raised in DC. I'm grateful that I get to teach and still live in DC. Um, I identify as a pedagogical curator, among other things. Um, and I'm proud that I have two siblings, as well as a niece currently in Ward 7 public schools. Um, and I'm here really because I want to make recommendations for how the state board and OSSI um, revise, hopefully rewrite, not just revise the, the learning standards that ref so that they reflect the needs of students, um, as well as families and communities in DC. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jessica. Glad to have you. Uh, Karen Hopkins. You know, Karen is on her phone. Let me just make sure I don't have to unmute her. Karen? Karen? Can you can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry about that. That's right. Um, I live in Maryland and I work in DC. 
And my background is more in informal education settings. So I've worked on um, community-based literacy programs, developed human rights education curriculum, worked with international students, um, and I'm also a parent of a toddler. Um, I'm the regional representative for Human Rights Educators USA for DC, which is a national network of human rights educators and advocates um, that are committed to expanding human rights education within the US. Um, and I'm really excited about this revision process because I think it's a really unique opportunity to make DC standard, standards a model for standards around the country to be more reflective of communities that the students come from, to incorporate human rights principles and also service learning. Great, thank you so much, Karen Hopkins. Karen Lee, I'm gonna ask you to hold on one second. I'm gonna invite Alyssa Richardson who joined us to introduce herself and then we're gonna come to you. Hello everyone, I'm Alyssa Richardson. I'm a rising junior. And the reason I wanted to be a part of this is because I wanna be, help be a part of, you know, the future and help create, uh, you know, standards that are that catered to everybody and catered to all the students in DCPS. So I just really wanted to, you know, be a part of the process and, you know, think about some future career goals for myself. So this can help inspire me to see what I wanna do in the future. So that's why I wanted to join. Great. We're so glad to have you, Alyssa. Thank you. Karen Lee. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Karen Lee, and I am a social studies teacher and department chair at Thurgood Marshall Academy. Uh, so I live and work in Ward 8, and I just finished my uh, 16th year teaching in classrooms east of the river. Um, and I also get to help facilitate our student-led activist group, Pathways to Power, uh, who've been really involved in, in the community around gun violence and creating solutions for um, traveling safely. And I think this work is um, really important to me because I'm often somebody that students come to with their frustrations around what the curriculum is saying. And so uh, I feel lucky to be in with a group of educators who are willing to look at it and take an honest look at what our curriculum is uh, and incorporate that feedback and really center students' experiences um, and action civics is a, a huge component of where we're moving towards. Great. Thank you so much, Karen. We're glad to have you. Lamar. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lamar Bathia. I live in Ward 1 and I teach in Ward 7 at Statesman College Preparatory Academy, where I serve as the Founding Kings 101 instructor. My position at the school, I am developing and teaching the history curriculum or humanities curriculum. We, our focus is on teaching an inclusive African and African American history and identity development course. And I'm excited to be a part of this committee because I truly believe that all social studies and humanities curriculum should really focus on the idea of shared humanity as different cultures across different time periods have a lot of similar parallel stories. And if we only focus on one specific narrative, then we are cutting out swaths of other cultures across the history curriculum that we currently teach. Thank you so much, Lamar. Laura, uh, sorry, Laura Fuchs. Yep. Hi, I'm Laura Fuchs. I teach at HD Woodson in Ward 7, and I live in Ward 5 of DC. And I am a social studies teacher for the past 13 years at Woodson, and I focus primarily on modern world history and advanced placement US government. Um, and world history really is my passion, and global education and the need to connect students to the world. Um, and I love the fact that DC has two years of required um, world history at the high school level. It's pretty rare. Um, and it's something that I believe should stay. So part of the reason that I am here is because I do believe that standards kind of set the floor for what our students get access to, especially in DC public schools, where we see a race to the bottom and anytime standards are made more flexible, DC just cuts programming and cuts access to our students east of the river. So I firmly believe that, I believe that I can kind of bring to the table just that implementation perspective in terms of not necessarily how you teach it, which I mean, I can bring as well to so many others here who I'm sure are even better, but that Kind of how it works in the political context of this city, which we can never fully remove from any discussion we're having. Thank you, Laura. Lauren. 
Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lauren Grimes. I'm a Ward 7 resident. Um, I'm a native of Washington, D.C. Um, I serve as an educational consultant, and um, I founded a youth civic engagement nonprofit here in the district, um, the Community Enrichment Project. So um, this social studies revision work is really important to me because I'm a, a product of DCPS, and I've seen firsthand uh, the need for updated standards. Um, also, as an academic and consultant, I believe it's important for our education system to recognize that youth come from diverse backgrounds, uh, races, ethnicities, and they deserve social study standards that fully represent them. Um, and, and lastly, I'll just say, I believe we have a great opportunity to encourage um, student voice and civic action within the social studies ed framework. Great. Thank you so much, Lauren. Maria. Hello, I am Maria Marable Bunch. I currently work at the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian. I am associate director there and I am in charge of museum learning. So um, I have throughout my career have worked in museum education. Uh, being on this committee is very important to me. I have a long history with DC, yes, public, with DC public schools. Back in the 90s, I worked uh, in the um, DC PS and SI Museum Magnet School program and was the liaison between both institutions to establish um, museum related curriculum for Stuart Hobson and for Brent Elementary School. Uh, I've always felt that with all the resources within the city of Washington, that Washington, DC should have the best school district in the country because of these resources. And so I am always very interested in how these resources are applied to developing the curriculum and what and what is provided for the children in the schools. I think it's very important for children to know who they are, to know about the people that are around them because it's build better communities and make for better citizens. Um, and I look forward to working with all of you uh, and using the resources at the Smithsonian to help them infuse this new curriculum. And I am a resident of Ward 4. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. We're glad to have you. Melanie. Hi, good evening. My name is Melanie Holmes, and I am a sixth grade rural geography teacher and serve as the social studies department chair at New Farland Middle School, which is in Ward 4. I'm also a second year doctoral student at Howard University where I'm studying black power throughout the African diaspora. And the reason why these revisions are so important to me is because even though the guiding principles sound good, they talk about freedom, equal rights, justice, diversity, the reality is that the way that they are written and implemented imposes limits on the content that allows curriculum to truly be culturally inclusive. And so I'll, even though this is long overdue, this year, certainly of all years, it's definitely time to bring a change to our curriculum, which can be most easily achieved through the revision of the standards. Wonderful. So glad to have you, Melanie. Michael. Good evening, everyone. My name is Matt Stevens. I am the Director of Social Studies for Friendship Public Charter School. Um, prior to that, I served as a social studies teacher instructional coach and school-based administrator. Uh, we have campuses in wards one, four, five, six, seven, and eight, and I live in Brentwood, Maryland. Um, echoing a number of colleagues, I'll just say that I'm excited to be here because I think that as the nation's capital, um, the students and families of Washington, D.C. deserve social study standards that serve as a model uh, for schools to create curriculum that's not only inclusive and accessible, but promotes student agency and activism. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. Molly France. Hi, I'm Molly. I live in Ward 6, and I work at Two Rivers Public Charter School in the Instructional Guide, which means I do coaching and curriculum development and work with all of the teachers in our elementary schools. Um, we're in Ward 5 and 6. And I'm really excited to be here for a lot of the reasons everyone has said. I'm really looking forward to thinking about how we can make sure the standards we're using are really guiding teachers to have a really anti-racist, inclusive classroom when they approach their special studies work. Um, and I'm really excited to think specifically about how you bring this down to our younger learners. As a teacher, I taught three, four, and five-year-olds. And so I think that if it's 
starts with them, even younger than that, I have a toddler. And so it starts when they're little and has me really make sure that it goes from the time they're three and they come into our classrooms until they are graduating high school. Thank you so much. Molly Sloss. Molly, you may be on mute. Whoops. Hi, I'm Molly. Um, I am a DCPS graduate turned DCPS teacher. I'm a primary guide at Capitol Hill Montessori School, so I lead a mixed age community of three, four, five, and six year olds from all eight wards. Um, I am want to be a part of this work because we know that attitudes um, and implicit bias are formed and solidified by age six. Um, so taking a cognitive lens to these standards um, and making sure that we are presenting our children with the whole world um, while they are building their whole world internally. Thank you so much, Molly. Nicholas. Hello, how's everybody doing? Um, my name is Nick Ojeda. I have been teaching in the District of Columbia Public Schools since the year 2007. I am also a graduate of DC Public Schools. I'm a resident of Ward 5, and I currently, since 2012, I've been at the Duke Ellington School of the Arts doing um, US government, DC history, AP government, but I've taught several other social studies courses. So I was inspired to uh, join this advisory committee, and I'm grateful to be here because I'm really passionate about um, getting the voices of the unheard. Um, hot and told and also finding ways for young people to really make sure that in our curriculum young people have ways to take action um so they can have their voices heard and be agents of change in their community so i look forward to being here also you know i'm very familiar with the standards for a lot of courses and um one other thing is just finding a simple way to make sure that we can cover what we need to as um, you know, our standards sometimes, there are a whole lot of them. So, you know, I'm, I'm excited to be here. There there are quite a lot of them. Thank you so much, Nick. Rebecca. Hi, I'm Becca Schuweiler. I live in Ward 1 and teach in Ward, ward 4. Um, and I'm in a charter and I'm also bringing to this um, the lens of having taught IB um, and try, the challenge of trying to both meet um, you know, state as well as other external standards. And I also have taught a fair amount of the different social sciences. Um, and so really care about those. In addition to all of what everyone has said about powerful and empowering social studies standards, um, I also care a lot about historical thinking skills um, and making sure that those are not just the standalone, but are kind of embedded um, in a thoughtful way throughout. Wonderful, thank you so much, Becca. Reginald. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Reggie Williams. Uh, this is, I'm just finishing up my seventh year teaching in DC Public Schools, and I also am a DCPS graduate. I live in Ward 7 and currently teach at Banneker uh, High School, which is uh, my alma mater. Uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to being a part of this advisory board. To me, civic engagement is a important and I've had some opportunities especially since I've been at Banner to really get students involved and I'm looking forward to seeing it really embedded in the standards as far as civic engagement is concerned as well as making sure that cultural competency and just just a sense of of oneness with different cultures is also embodied in the standards as well so I'm looking forward to that opportunity. Great thank you so much Reggie. Sally. Now, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, hi, uh, I'm Sally Schwartz. I know some of you. In fact, I'm so happy to see Jessica Recker, who was uh, involved in a trip I did when I first started working in global education. Anyway, uh, I was born here in DC and graduate of DC public schools. I live in Ward 3 now. Um, and I taught social studies many years ago. Uh, now I am a uh, 
the director of an organization called Globalize DC, where we try to bring language learning and global education opportunity to DC public school students. Um, yes to everything that's been said before, um, but uh, I will add that my own interest is um, especially in making sure that we have not just global content, but uh, global context across the board, not just in world history, but in everything we do, there's a context and connections to the rest of the world. Um, I'm also, we, we have a classroom outside our doors in the streets right now, and I think it's really important that we have real world social studies and not just separate ourselves. So I want to think about ways we can really get kids out in the city and know the city and connect to the city. So um, that's what I bring. Thank you so much, Sally. Sarah. Hi, can you hear me? I hope I've unmuted. Um, my name is Sarah Busher, and I teach at Janney Elementary School. I'm a fourth grade teacher. I'm actually a native New Yorker, and I earned two graduate degrees before I learned that my native home state was a slave holding colony. Um, I am someone who's inherited um, kind of a false narrative of U.S. history, and I've taken it as my work to dismantle this narrative. I'm the mother of four children, three who are voters, one who is soon to be a voter. And I think a lot about the world um, that my children will inherit, and I think about my place in it, and the way I can be effective is in helping to ensure that education actively dismantles the racism that children perceive as early as three and four years of age. And I'm super grateful to be here. Thank you so much. Glad to have you, Sarah. Thank you. Scott. Good evening, everybody. My name is Scott Abbott. I am a Ward 4 resident. I am a, also a DCPS parent. I have two kids uh, that attend Seton Elementary School in Ward 6. Uh, and my, my main job is I work as the Director of Social Studies for DC Public Schools. So I work supporting teachers and students and administrators at all schools in the district, so in all eight wards. Um, and uh, our team leads work on curriculum development, professional development, assessments, partnerships, things like that. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I, I've worked with a number of you, or I'm currently working with you. Thanks, to, <laughs> thanks for being here tonight too, guys. Um, but I would say in terms of standards, I would echo a lot of what people have said, and I think has really captured pretty well in the resolution the State Board passed last year, um, why we want to have uh, revised social standards. Uh, adding on a little bit of a different lens as well. Um, this past semester, I taught a course at American University as an adjunct uh, supporting elementary social studies methods. And I think one of the things that we need to be mindful of is how can the standards be used as a tool to both emphasize the importance of social studies and really provide um, some of that knowledge building that Barbara was referencing um, at those early grade levels to make sure that we are laying a strong groundwork both for civic preparation, uh, but also for success for students in college and careers as well. Great. Thank you so much, Scott. And last but certainly not least, Shalina. Ms. Warren, you might be on mute. I apologize. I'm scrolling through to try and find. Here we go. Can we hear you now, Ms. Warren? Still can't hear you. Oh, the joys of technical difficulties in a time of digital. Um, I wonder, there's a function with the more or the more options, the three little dots, if under the microphone, I have to test, like I had to do it through my laptop. Okay. Select that as an option. I appreciate that insights. It looks like someone on the state board staff is reaching out. We'll see if we can solve the problem. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Well, Yay. amazing. 
good, good, good afternoon, everyone. Good evening, everyone. My name is Shalina Warren. I am a Dunbar High School teacher, DCPS, um, four-year teacher at Dunbar, 17-year teacher overall, um, former Arkansas teacher where I was a part of the 2006 revision of the standards for Arkansas. Um, I'm also the director of the Law and Public Policy Academy at Dunbar High School. So excited to be here. Sorry about the inconvenience. I'm trying to hear you. Um, but really, I am excited about this process because I teach all, all elective classes. And I want to see how they, such as uh, social action, public policy, um, human rights, how they can be embedded more into the uh, curriculum, as well as, um, which many people have already said, I'm a civic engagement and student voice is my passion. Um, that's going to be my uh, dissertation for Johns Hopkins um, as a doctoral student. So I'm very excited about how we can embed that and ensure that students have a choice and that their voice is being heard. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, before we move on, I want to make sure we also hear from my colleague on the state board, Karen Williams, and from our colleague at Aussie. So can I pass it to you, Karen, and then to you, Justin? Can you hear me? Yes. Well, I thank everyone who has volunteered to serve on this panel, on this committee. Social studies is a very important curriculum um, guideline for, especially for students who are marginalized. So I just wanted to thank all of you for being here. And I wanted to thank Jessica for convincing me that this is something I should be doing every week. <laughs> um, we, we plan to work in tandem, trying to do the best we can. If you have any problems or questions, feel free to call either one of us. As a matter of fact, Jessica made me um, swear that I would call each and every one of you between now and our next meeting so we could get to know each other. So rather than taking up time now, we will talk individually and very soon. And thank you for coming out for us tonight. Thank you, Karen. So glad to have you doing this work with me. Um, Justin. Sure, thanks, Jess. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Justin Tooley. I'm the Deputy Chief of Staff at Aussie. Uh, first, thank you all for giving us your time and talent to help us start this really important work. Uh, thank you to the State Board and Jess for really pushing us to uh, begin doing this work and to thinking deeply about updating our standards. Uh, we believe that it's, it's long overdue. We've had a lot of success in the past of getting public engagement and input and really trying to focus us on making the right decisions and giving us feedback through the use of sort of broad advisory committees. And it seems like we're in very good hands uh, with the expertise that is on the panel tonight. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, Aussie, we, we plan on, on on being a listening member of the advisory committee. Uh, sometimes that will be me, uh, and sometimes that might be someone else in the, in the agency. Uh, but uh, we, we plan to, to be here and to stay engaged throughout the process. Thanks so much. Great, thank you so much. Well, I'll just conclude and say, I'm really glad we took the time to give everyone the chance to share why they're here because I'm in awe. I'm just at absolutely delighted by the talent that you all bring to this work. I can't wait to learn from you uh, and to have you help guide our board in how we should be thinking about what needs to change to create social study standards that befit our students, that meet all of the various points you brought up around civic engagement, global consciousness, uh, anti-racist thinking and practice, understanding of the world in which they live. Um, so I'm super excited for that. I will just say again, my name is Jessica Sutter. Um, I represent Ward 6 on the state board. I am mostly excited about this work because I spent seven years at the beginning of my career as a middle school social studies teacher. I taught in the state of Illinois, in the city of Chicago, in the state of California, in the city of Los Angeles, and then here in Washington, DC. Um, I taught three different states worth of standards, including these ones that we are going to be working with uh, as our starting point here in DC. Um, and I'm, I'm moved by hearing from former students the impact that their civics lessons had on their life, 
has had on their life as voters. Uh, and I'm also chastened a bit by what I know I did not teach my students in our history classes, but by my own ignorance of our history and what I left out as a teacher. And so I am eager to make sure that the standards we create help all of our educators be prepared to help our students learn um, the complex story of our history as a country, as well as our place in the world. So thank you all for taking the time for that. Um, one thing I wanted to do at the start here is propose some norms for our time together. This is a combination of norms that some of my colleagues have used with us in state board meetings, uh, some that I've used with clients through the years, some that are informed by best practices of uh, courageous conversations and other work on inclusivity. So take a moment and look through these five. If you've got questions about what any of these mean, go ahead and either put a note in the chat or you can use the raise hand function under participants uh, and that will let us know that you'd like to speak. If you have a question about any of these, go ahead and raise it now because if some of these need to be changed, if there are things that you do not understand, um, or there are ones that you'd like to talk about, I wanna make sure we can do that. While you're reading through them, I will explain two that I think I want uh, to make sure folks are clear on. So the first is the be present and build energy. We're inviting you all to come together two hours a month during dinner time. So I know that during this time, folks may need to eat, folks may need to get up and, and take care of personal needs, and I certainly expect that that happens. What I do hope is that folks will be present when they are video on in front of us, and that they'll seek to add energy to the conversation. So asking good questions, making suggestions, clarifying things that are unclear, but bringing yourself and your full energy to the conversation to keep momentum going. Number three, make space, take space, was one that I thought was really thoughtfully worded in a meeting I was part of, which is mind your own talk time. So make sure that you are making space for others to raise their voices, but also that you are taking space when you have a point that adds to the conversation that needs to be made that others are not bringing up. The final thing is the assume positive intent but name impact. I want to make sure that we come to these meetings together assuming the best from one another, but that if someone says or does something that leaves a negative impact for you, that you don't sit with that without voicing it, that you do share that something that was said doesn't sit well, or you have a question, or you want to push on that. So I'll use as an example, I did not add people's pronouns next to their names on the slide, and a participant asked that we do add the pronouns next to folks' names. I will make sure that happens before this deck is posted publicly, but I'm glad someone raised that to me. It wasn't something that immediately came to mind for me, but it is important and I appreciate that being brought up. So it wasn't my intention to offend by failing to do that, but I am glad someone mentioned it so that I know that it needs to be done. So I hope that we can take that into account. I'm gonna wait now and see if anyone has questions they wanna raise or put in the chat. Make so see people's hands being raised here. Okay. I don't see any hands raised and I don't see any additional questions. Is it okay to move on? Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're getting into the meat of this conversation. What is our purpose together? What are we doing together over our time as the Social Studies Standards Advisory Committee? We are coming together to create a set of guiding principles informed by public input that the state board will adopt and then share with OSI to guide the written content of the new DC State Social Studies Standards. So what goes into the those principles. These are questions the board thinks we'd like to see asked about the standards and that we hope the guiding principles will answer. Are there things missing from these questions or things you expect that as a member of this advisory committee you'd like to make sure you get to share as part of 
how you want to see the standards revised or rewritten. And again, you can feel free to use the raise hand function under the participant list or type it into the chat. Not sure I know what order these hands come up in, but I'm going to start with Fadal. Okay, awesome. I had no clue if that button was working. Um, awesome. Um, so I guess for me, um, a couple of things are pretty big. Um, I would really like to see more of a move towards a, them a thematic organization of the standards. Um, I feel like that would help a lot, just like retention of information. Um, and one thing I put in my application that I think is really big in terms of what's missing is in general, like a lack of civic education. If you look at the DC standards, um, there are effectively no civic standards between the grades, uh, grades three and 11, which is a problem. <laughs> Um, and I think we should definitely be addressed. And I would be curious to know, what does it look like to vertically um, progress through like an understanding of citizenship from the ages of pre-K through your senior year of, of high school? Great, I appreciate that, Fidal. And I hope that you'll see a question for reviewing the standards that helps it tack at least part of that uh, piece that you just raised about where content is covered and not. Uh, it looks like Jessica has a hand raised. Yes, good evening. So first, I forgot to mention my pronouns, I'm she and her. Um, one thing that I love us to consider as we look at the first question in terms of what are the strengths and weaknesses of the existing standards is when I think about the term anti-racist. First, it's a verb, like it's not a noun, it's not an adjective. And the question I really hope we ask ourselves is like, what's, what's, what needs to be different with the standards and not what needs to be different with our students, because even in some of our introductions, some of what I was hearing was like, well, our students need to know this. Our students need to do this as if. I know my students um, are pretty strong and active um, citizens, and so how can we make sure the standards reflect what students already know and are able to do, but honors the fact that um, we do want to continue to expand. Um, how they apply that learning and also facilitating learning that's relevant to them um, and their communities and their families. Thank you, Jessica. I'm gonna move to Laura next, and it looks like we've got some affirmations in the chat, so keep them coming. I just had a question about, is the next slide gonna be about process? So I guess my questions are more around like process. Um, so the next slide is not about process yet, but ask your question because I think it's important that you raise it now. Okay, so I guess my question is kind of like the, the arc of progression of this group, right? Kind of, you've got a long time to work on this, which is good. Um, like, for example, as I mentioned, you know, I love modern world history. It's like my one true love. And it's certainly what I specialize in too academically in terms of my knowledge base. So like, that'd be where I could, you know, in terms of really talking about thematic and chronological. And while, yeah, I'd want to help talk about the big picture, you know, K through 12 or pre-K through 12, um, will there be a point where we do kind of start breaking off and really looking at kind of the courses themselves, um, possibly changing them to have that vertical alignment and all of that, but also kind of looking at how you might structure a world history course, you know, versus a U.S. history course, because they're not, you know, exactly the same. Yeah, I think it's a great question, Laura, and I will say um, sort of two things in response. One, um, when we do get a little later in the presentation, um, you'll see that there's a question around, should we form sort of subgroups and subcommittees within this to dive deep in spaces? And I did want to put that to the group rather than making a decision on that. Um, I will also make sure that in future meetings that folks are getting the slides ahead of time. I just didn't want to jump the boat uh, for all of us getting together the first time. But your second point, I think, is a good one, which is around what kinds of changes we're going to be able to affect um, in this. And I think the State Board is committed to hearing from you what you think is the way we should approach this. So I don't want to say, Yes, of course we want to change the course progression. Yes, of course we want to change these things or to say, no, we're definitely not open to that. 
I believe um, one other participant had emailed a question about exactly that. Like, is there a possibility that courses and things will change? I know we need to hear from all of you and we need to hear from the public what the interest and appetite for that is. So please keep asking these questions as we start in these initial meetings um, and we'll come up with the answers together. Looks like I have a hand up from Rebecca. So just to your original question about are there other questions to be asked, I think there's also a question about grain size of standards. You know, like when I taught in Maine, the standard was essentially student will know US history. Whereas I think BC is much farther on the spectrum. Like I've joked one time, it's like, what color was Abraham Lincoln's beard? And so like what, I think that's an open question of where that helpful line is that we should probably think about. Great, I think that's a really good question. And again, I hope you'll see that later too, when we talk about uh, reading the existing standards and coming back with reflections and feedback on them. Melanie. Hi, I just wanted to add where it says, what is currently missing? I would suggest that we also add who is currently missing because there are parts of the curriculum, I'm sorry, the standards that suggest names of people we can include if we're using a certain standard. But I think that there are plenty of historical figures that should be added if we're gonna create an example list. Great, thank you for that feedback, Melanie. That's actually something our board members talked about when we reviewed the standards as a committee is, how did the list get chosen of who the exemplars were right. um, and, and what might that look like going forward? I think I have a question from Emily. Yeah, just to kind of draw on what Fidel, Melanie, and Jessica were saying, just thinking like another question could be kind of the extent to which we want to prioritize content standards, that is, you know, names, dates, things like that, versus kind of more like historical thinking skill, critical thinking skill standards, um, and sort of like what is the right balance between um, what students need to kind of know factually versus what students should be able to do and just like thinking about transfer and things like that. Great. That's a good point, Emily. Thank you. Um, Barbara has a question in the chat and so I'm going to address it verbally. Um, the question is, it, it sounds like you're saying we're developing guiding principles versus writing or iteratively, iteratively approving drafts of the standards, which suggests our work would be done before the writing begins. Is this correct? So yes and no. Our guiding principles will be done before the writing begins. This group will also be looking at drafted standards to affirm or critique whether the standards align with the guiding principles we set out. So for instance, if one of the guiding principles is about a larger grain size for standards or a uh, we'll say a, a different course progression and the revised standards drafts come back and do not have those things, it will be this group's charge to review the drafts in conjunction with the guiding principles and let the writing team know they're on the right track or not on the right track um, and, and to give that critique as we go. Does that answer your question, Barbara? Yes, that's, that's great, thank you. Okay, other, are there other hands I haven't seen or other questions here that we should be thinking about that we wanna make sure this group ask, is able to ask and propose answers to as part of the guiding principle? This isn't your only chance to say this, so just know this is our first, our first go round at this, but I wanna make sure I haven't missed any burning thoughts from folks. Okay. If you put your hand up in the participant chat, go ahead and take it down so that when we do the next round, you can put your hand back up again. So this is one of those places where, given the diversity of our group, this is going to be something that folks in this virtual room are well aware of and that other folks may not be aware of. And what I wanted to do was propose these statements as, this is how I think about this. If this is not how you think about this, I want you to add critique comments so that we have a, an opportunity to come to a shared understanding of what's a standard. So when we talk about standards for learning, what are we talking about? My best understanding of standards for learning is that they are statements of what students should know and be able to do, perhaps in a given subject, perhaps by the end of a particular grade, 
before having been considered to have completed a course or as a requirement preceding graduation. Are there other ways you would describe or define a standard of learning that are not captured there? Emily, is this a new hand? Okay. Okay. So if that's Melanie. I, I would just add again that the who students should know is also very important. I think that when we exclude people, historical figures, we're doing our students a huge disservice and we're telling a, a half a half history, a half truth of who students are and where they've come from. So I just would add the who to the, the who. yeah. Okay. Um, I've got Karen Lee and then Laura, I'm gonna come to you next. Yeah, I one of my big sources of frustration with standards is reflected in this list that it's like a concrete fact <laughs> and not sort of the connection that builds with historical understanding. And so pushing beyond sort of this one thing that you know, so now you check the box more into the connections and the across content, across time, um, sort of thorough lines that can exist in history. Um, so I just wanted to add that I believe standards are also what a student has a right to know. That a school cannot deny them access to this information. So like cutting social studies classes right at a school, right? To make it some humanity thing where they don't ever actually get to learn history. Um, so I do think standards are also a rights document. It's not just what students should do. It's what we as a system have an obligation to, I mean, you know, provide as a service to our students to know this information. Thank you for that, Laura. Lamar? I was just going to say, speaking to, I think it was Miss Lee, your name is abbreviated on the, the chat, so I, I apologize if I'm saying the wrong name. But speaking to her point, one way we could definitely help our students is by teaching thematically rather than chronologically. I know that was a question on the previous slide, but teaching through themes helps students develop a, a deeper connection between content. If we just teach things in the order in which they happen, then it's harder for them to really see the big scope of something that might have affected multiple different groups of people if we only focus on one specific timeline. Thank you, Lamar. Scott Abbott? Uh, thanks. Um, I was just going to add, so I think we've talked a little bit about this idea of knowledge. Um, and I think there's been a, a couple things in the chat about the difference between factual knowledge and then conceptual content knowledge. Um, so I would push to, to say that, you know, we want to make sure that the standards are laying out conceptual content knowledge uh, as well as skills. And then the other word that I don't see here yet is the idea of dispositions. So this is like, what are the ways of being that the standards are encouraging? And particularly, I think this comes into play with things that folks have mentioned around civic engagement. Um, and then in a very practical sense, I also just want to point out that standards are really the basis for uh, writing curriculum and assessments in social studies. So we have to keep that in mind as we're thinking about making adjustments that this is what teachers or districts will be using um, in order to write those things. Great, thank you, Scott. And you are anticipating my next slide. Um, what I wanna say though, before we move on here is I wanna offer a proposal. So um, in addition to Scott's point about this dispositions, Jessica has put in the chat a comment around feelings or attitudes or beliefs um that might make sense in this definition so what i'd like to do is create essentially a, a shared document a google document with this definition of standards and i will add in the notes that i got from this portion of our conversation but as we share follow-up information from this meeting i'll make sure that this group gets a live link to the document to contribute to the document so that we can collectively iterate between now and our next meeting on how we're talking about the learning standards and what we mean by them um, as a document. We will have a public Google Drive that the public will be able to view documents, but I wanna make sure that this document that I share with all of you is able to be live so we can collaborate on, on it in the interim. 
um, and come to a, a feeling and a definition of standard that we feel we can all stand by as we think about our purpose in this work. If that's agreeable to folks, I'll do that. If you've got other ideas or other suggestions on how we should handle it, please go ahead and you can either private chat it to me or send me an email um, about other ways we can move forward on this concept of a standard. Again, if you put your hand up in the participant list, go ahead and take it down because we're going to keep going in some conversation. So one thing I thought might be helpful for background knowledge here uh, is making sure that everyone's on the same page about DC standards. So DC has statewide standards in some subjects. We have math, ELA, science, and health standards that were adopted by the State Board of Education over various years. And you can see Common Core in 2010, Science in 2013, and Health Education in 2016. The current DC social study standards are a little odd. And Barbara, I know you were involved in the writing of this. So um, th this to me is particularly an interesting point. They predate the existence of a State Board of Education in DC. So they were written by DCPS in 2006. If When you look at the standards document that, uh, that Alex shared with everyone, uh, at the end, there's a list of everybody who contributed to the writing of it. And they're teachers from all sorts of DCPS schools and content experts. Um, but they were not adopted by the State Board because the State Board did not exist. So these standards we're writing are an opportunity to create DC statewide standards that were are contributed to by LEAs all across the district um, and adopted by the State Board. And that's our goal. Um, Yes, yeah, so Barbara, Scott asked a question and Barbara answered it right there in the chat that they were approved by the DCPS school board, uh, which was a district school board rather than a state board of education. Does that all make sense? Um, C3 wasn't around yet, so they're not part of the current standard. So uh, everyone familiar with C3 or Molly, do you wanna share with folks the C3 framework so that we have that as a common piece of working knowledge? Um, sure, I can put it, a link to it in the chat. Um, when I wrote that, you know, lets me know, lets you guys know when I became a teacher. When I wrote uh, social studies curriculum in Louisiana, um, we use C3, um, which is a inquiry-based um, thematic framework for teaching social studies that ends with a civic action at the end of every unit. So it kind of ties in a lot of these ideas. Here's a link. Thank you. So Molly, when you say you were writing curriculum in Louisiana, so the state standards weren't involving the C3, but the curriculum that the state adopted was? Yeah, so they used a curriculum called Louisiana Believes, which is, as you can imagine, written by the um, rich white establishment of Louisiana and like super, super bad. And I was teaching in New Orleans where every school had um, autonomous curriculum, um, standalone charters. Um, so every school had to look at Louisiana Believes and rewrite their own curriculum. So that's what we did. And we use C3 instead of Louisiana. Great. So before we move on to the next slide, which again, folks, you guys are just building wonderful connective tissue through the flow of conversation I hope we'd have. Um, are there any questions about the standards that folks did not put in the chat that they want to raise now? Lamar, is that hand new or is that a prior hand? Well, that's a prior hand. I can put okay. that out. That's all right. I want to make sure I'm not missing anything. So again, this is my understanding in the way I think and talk about it, but I'm not sure it's an accurate understanding that others share. Um, if I think about the difference between standards and curriculum, I think about standards as the what and the who, to, to the good point that Melanie has raised a few times, um, students should know and be able to do, and the dispositions that go along with it. Curriculum to me is, I think of it as how those standards are taught. In DC, we have statewide standards in the subjects I just listed, but we do not have a statewide curriculum. And DC, unlike states, for instance, like Texas, um, does not have a statewide, text, statewide textbook adoption. So curriculum design and textbook selection is left to the discretion of LEAs. So what we're working on are guiding principles to guide the standards and then feedback on the standards, but we are not dealing with textbook selection or curriculum design. Are there questions or comments or thoughts on that here? Um, Nick. Oh, yes. Um, I couldn't figure out how to raise my hand, so I wrote the question in there. 
but I was just thinking from what people were discussing earlier, um, I know they were in this advisory capacity, but I'm just curious, um, is there already like something that people in the State Board of Education have eyed as a model or things that you're gonna throw at us that you've already looked at? Just curious. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. So I will say that I do not have another state standards as a model of how I think we should do things. I do know that we have on this advisory committee a number of folks who have worked on other states standards. And so I look, I will be looking to them to share things they think were good or less good about those standards. Um, to Barbara's point at the beginning of this conversation, DC standards are very well regarded. Um, they are now old, but they are well regarded in the way they are constructed. Um, and so I think we've got a question whether some of the aspects that made them well regarded still stand um, and are worth holding on to while others need to be changed. Um, I think the other thing is this C3 framework that we've talked about um, is something I know DCPS has used to inform its curriculum work. Um, and Scott can talk more about that perhaps, but I think I think that probably is going to come up in the conversation as well. Um, I think it's also worth noting that the old D the current DC standards were adapted, and Barbara, again, correct me if I'm wrong here, from Massachusetts and New York state standards. I think they're credited in the description as standards that were consulted as part of the process. Massachusetts um, and California. In California. So it, it may be that that there are standards that have been updated since that we will want to look to. But I do want to make sure that folks have confidence in the fact that we're not about to drop a set of standards on you and say, thanks so much for being advisors. Here are the ones we want. Um, we have definitely not gotten to that point at all. Mike, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think I agree with your first bullet of historically. I feel like that's typically how the model throughout education has operated, but I also just want to celebrate the opportunity we have to maybe not fall into a pattern of typically following such a model. Specifically, what I'm thinking of is, you know, even if like we think pedagogy would be oppressed, I wouldn't want to create a model that allows itself to easily replicate itself, where students are going to historically continue just to be the objects of our standards, of then the curriculum that schools are going to teach based off of those standards. Um, and pulling in what I think Karen surfaced earlier, it's I think it's really important. And I, I would encourage us to not, and I'm hopeful that we don't just create a laundry list of the who and the what to know that is then up to schools to like transfer this knowledge directly to kids. I like that that point about not just letting the students be the objects of the curriculum, Mike. Um, Laura, you you have a comment in the chat do you want to elaborate on that a bit about what you mean um by the sort of shift from standards to curriculum and the potential for manipulation there well i do think for example and i'll just use my own experience in world history our modern world that the standards when you start looking at them cover a very wide array of different cultures and groups and while the way they're written is very kind of fact-based, and if you just taught it that way, it wouldn't be interesting, you really do get to cover, there's a lot of opportunities to really do deep dives all over the world. Um, what sometimes can happen though, is that people can pick the standards they're most comfortable with to create a curriculum around, and those being the ones usually based in Western civilization. Um, and so while the standards actually, as they stand, could provide for a very global um, education, um, and again, it doesn't mean they can't be improved and that there's not a lot of room for improvement, but they do actually provide for that. But currently, many places, I think, do not interpret them that way, and they stick with what is comfortable and what's already been done. And so part of my concern would be, right, that, yeah, we're advisory, so even then it might not change things, but even if we manage to get major changes, if the people developing the curriculums can still kind of just, you know, prioritize certain standards and everything kind of just stays the same. Yeah, the standards, you know, we pat ourselves on the back and everything moves apace and people continue to move with what they're comfortable with. Um, so, 
And I don't really be prescriptive and, you know, force things on people because I also kind of, I do believe that there should be, you know, some form of flexibility to learn and deep dive and prioritize things based on interest, et cetera. But so it's a, it's a tricky needle to thread. There's no doubt. Um, but I do think that, you know, standards documents get you so far. And then it's kind of a question of, you know, what is the next step when we do kind of have a freewheeling system here. So I'd love to hear from others on uh, questions or concerns you've got that, that may in fact align with what Laura brings up, because I think it's a really good point And one that I've been tossing around in my head since I started con trying to convince my colleagues on the state board that we should take this work on. Uh, one, one piece that is complicated about the social studies standards in any state is that you, you have a tension between adding more content to make sure that the standards are broad and inclusive, but then you have a tension of you don't have any more years of schooling to teach the content. So how do we deal with the tension of breadth versus depth? And how do we work to make it less likely that we're going to narrowly select aspects of a broad set of standards that are comfortable or easy or familiar to teach um, rather than grappling with the complexity of all that is part of the standards. Some good comments in the chat. Other thoughts? I'll, I'll be looking for hands to raise to join the conversation. Adal? Yeah, um, I think this is a really good question, especially in terms of breadth and depth. I feel like that's like the the ultimate social studies teacher dilemma. Um, I think we I think it'll be really important to think ver vertically when it comes to breadth and depth, because I do think the way certain things are like paced from K through 12 um, don't always make the best sense. Um, I think the I think the standards, in my opinion, don't hold um, elementary stu um, school students up to like the highest standard that they could be held up to. Um, and I think there's more that could be learned in elementary school and that that could address some of the breadth issues. Um, in terms of implementation and making sure like we can combat this issue of teachers prioritizing certain things, I, I think that's I think that's so important. And I think what it will come down to is um, either SBOE or DCPS or whoever this would fall into, making sure that there are, like, are some materials available, especially for things that we're going to be introducing that a lot of social studies teachers don't have a ton of um, experience teaching, right? Because what's going to end up happening is they're either going to, when it comes down to prioritize things, they're either not going to teach those things or they're not going to teach them very well because they, they're not super versed in whatever it is. So I think that's going to be really important. Um, we can't just like throw our teachers, give our teachers expectations and not give them the support um, I'm sure a lot of teachers in this in this chat are like nodding your head because you've you've had plenty of expectations thrown, <laughs> thrown at you. And you haven't been given the requisite amount of time or whatever that you need to do it um, or resources. So I think that's something for us to think about, or maybe that's more for SBOE to think about um, if that's outside of the purview of this group. But that's definitely something that has to come up. Thank you, Fidal. Looks like you got some some agreement in the chat comments. There um, looks like. Melanie has her hand up. Melanie, you might be on mute. Certainly was, sorry. That's all right. Um, so, to Laura's point earlier, it we do have a lot of standards um, for social studies in DCPS. And, you know, it's interesting to see which standards get the priority. So, for instance, Again, I teach sixth grade world geography and I'm working on curriculum for my, sorry, I'm working on curriculum for my individual school right now. And so as we are trying to write the curriculum, we just took a look at all of the sixth grade social studies standards, um, one of my colleagues and I, and we just saw so many good standards that are just left out. They're just sitting neatly in this PDF, but they're, they're left out of the curricular modules that teachers 
um, are encouraged to use when teaching. So, you know, as we revise the standards, I guess I would just say there are some good ones in here that should be uplifted as opposed to kind of just ignored. Because if I hadn't looked at this PDF, which I would bet that teachers don't, um, I wouldn't have known, you know. And so oftentimes I feel as if I'm going against the grain. If I want to include more people, more places, more events that are culturally inclusive and relevant to my students or even just relevant to current events. Um, a lot of times I get questions from admin or superintendents, you know, how is this fitting pacing? How is this fitting what's in Canvas? This is not what you're supposed to be doing. But um, we, we do have some things in here that we should use. But again, there are, are many, many gaps that we should be filling with more explicit words, people and places that um, that are missing as well. Thank you, Melanie. Um, looks like there's some good recurring themes that are coming up in the chat too. And one of them, Daniel, your comment um, passed mine in the ether. Um, Shalina made the point to Fidal that in Arkansas, they had done professional development for teachers on the standards once they were done. So one thing that I sort of I have in mind as we embark on this whole process is that We've pulled together an expert cadre of this advisory committee to offer these guiding principles before the writing begins. The advisory committee is also going to be reviewing the drafts to check for alignment on that. My deep hope is that folks that are part of this group will also offer guidance on what happens next? What do we do with this when it is done? Because we have on this committee so many teachers and we have academics and we have uh, longtime residents of the district and graduates of DC public schools and folks who I think are well positioned to say this can't stop just when we have the standards but here are the things we want to see next and that's my hope too is that this begins to set the stage for not only what happens with the writing of the standards but what also happens with the implementation. There's a couple of folks who put comments in the chat who haven't spoken up yet so I want to see Sally do you want to do you want to talk more about what you've written in there or Daniel do you want to give voice to what you've shared? Am I muted? Can you hear me? Yes, Sally. Yep. Okay. Um, yes, I was slightly involved last time with the standards, and I think it's really hard to eliminate standards. And I think it's really important to get rid of the less important standards rather than just adding, um, and then having the teachers on the ground choose the ones that they want to teach to. There, I just think there are a lot of standards that now, if we are rethinking what needs to be taught or what we need to bring to the classroom um, that sort of eliminating is part of it um, and also jessica i have a a process question that i can wait till later to ask um, should i ask it now or wait why don't you go ahead and send it to me privately in the chat um, okay. and then i'll come back to you if it seems to make sense now or if we're gonna come to it later and let you know very good Thank you, Sally. I think that point is really important. And, and I, I do think that guidance from you all on where to cut standards um, will be incredibly important. Daniel, go ahead. All right, so there's a ton of research on successful and unsuccessful policy and standards implementation. And I wonder if that might be a goal of the committee or a subcommittee to review some of that research. Um, I know that there's a lot of experience on the committee already in terms of designing standards. But um, again, I wonder if that would be something that we'd consider taking on is reviewing some of that literature um, to help guide um, our implementation efforts um, on the front end. I would love to see that, Daniel, and figure out how we weave that into our time together. So let's definitely connect on that because I think that's important. Um, Nick, we're gonna go next to you. Um. Okay, um, I guess I just am thinking about two things. Um, the first, just taking it back to the conversation about alignment, um, as especially starting in the elementary years, I think it's important that even if you teach something and we consider something in elementary or early middle school, I don't know, something like the Civil War, for example, which isn't really in the standards for US history, um, but let's say even if it was, I don't think that's a problem because I do think that you have to keep on hitting certain 
major strands um, or major topics throughout the course of schooling because you know you may be understanding it differently or comprehending it let's say you've got something younger i guess the main point i'm trying to say is like we shouldn't be oh well they learned this when they were in this grade so you know we don't need to reconsider that for when they're studying a similar theme um, at the upper level um does that make sense yep and then the next thing just in terms of yeah i think really it, it is important that we make very calculated decisions as this as an advisory committee when we do make a point and a statement even to go so far as to say is what we are deeming our students um have the right to be able to to know so i guess you know just to echo that when we think about whether we're going to add things or condense things, you know, we, we all do carry that weight in this committee on what we're going to do. So. Thank you, Nick. I appreciate that. Um, Alex O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you. Um, I don't really know too well the process of like LEAs choosing particular um, standards to use. But one thing that I noticed is I was like reviewing the standards for U.S. history is that it feels like there's not a like a great interconnectedness between the different standards like for example like it's broken down into like time periods for U.S. history of like the Cold War to like um modern day in a sense and I feel like what that allows for is it if, if it's not being taught like thematically it's allowing for like people to choose not to cover important things because like no one sees the the, the benefits of teaching it as like um, as it relates to, uh, as, as one particular thing relates to another and the impact um, something that like happened in the early 20th century may still be affecting people in the 21st century um, I feel like the kind of sectioning off of like time periods um, especially in U.S. history, is less effective, and I think it kind of like allows for um, when these standards are being chosen, like to be used for curriculum. I think it, it's allowing for like important things to be left out. Thank you, Alex. Um, Mike, is that a new hand or an old hand? Sorry, I forgot to take it off. I'll do that now. That's okay. <laughs> then I'm going to come to Jessica. Um, thank you. And and Alex, I really appreciate the spirit of, of what you just brought because that's been my experience both as a student and as a teacher, like teaching beyond um, chronology. And what I would love to add to this conversation is that as I think about the areas of focus for our group, I keep coming back to the notion of being anti-racist. And I think in order to honor the spirit of, of anti-racism, which is connected to um, fighting against structures that perpetuate racism, and I would also add um, white supremacy, one of the things that I hope our standards or the guiding principles we offer with the standards can do is help teachers, and I have a lot of faith in DC teachers, but teach beyond heroes and holidays, because one of the, the most devastating impacts of studying this particular historical moment is there's this sense that police brutality and state sanctioned white violence is like new. And it's like every every time these episodes erupt, there's this historical amnesia that I think gets facilitated through stuff like teaching standards and, and curriculum. So I hope that we can write, help to guide the standards such that we look at themes and long histories um, around specific themes and how they continue to emerge over time, because this is not episodic, it's, it's thematic. It is the root of our nation, like, like issues like racism, white supremacy, resistance, power, oppression, et cetera. Thank you for that, Jessica. And I think, I mean, one thing that is clear to me in listening to the folks who have spoken and offered thoughts in the chat is that there is a real desire for this connectivity, this long story, this thread that runs through to make sure that we're not teaching once, calling it done and moving on. Um, but what I think how we, how we think about that in the guiding principles 
is something we'll keep talking about as we go through our next conversations together to figure out what would it look like to try to say to the writing committee, this is what we're looking for from you. This is what we want these standards to look like so that they accomplish this thing that you're all giving voice to, this need for thematic, this need for connections, this need across vertical alignment in the grades. Um, and I apologize that I don't remember who has mentioned it, but a few folks have given rise to this comment around a need for more content. I know Fidal did, um, but I feel like there were others. More content for our elementary school students um, and trusting that they have the capacity to build that knowledge at an earlier age. Before I answer Sally's question around authority for the state board and ASI and, and all of that, I wanna just not cut this conversation off. So are there other things here around standards, curricula, thematic places that you want to make sure that we can dig in on on this work before I ask, answer that question and move us to the next couple slides. Scott. Oh, thanks. Um, so one thing I'm not sure if we've gotten to yet, but in, as we think about the design, the granularity, the chronological versus thematic, the sort of like what is included and what is not. I think one thing that we need to be thinking about is what research exists out there um, about different approaches to organizing state standards. And is, you know, is there research to support different approaches? And I would say also like when we think about, um, you know, say like organizing a history class versus a geography class, are we taking into account the ways that, the ways of thinking and the disciplinary ways that things are organized or periodized within those disciplines while also being mindful that the ways that they are currently organized may need to be pushed on because they may be coming from a legacy that is not so much anti-racist um, as, as we might uh, want them to be. So I just wanted to make that point about looking at the research. Great, and um, Daniel had also brought up research. So uh, I wanna make sure that, that that is something that you hear me saying, I hear loud and clearly that a piece of our work together is to make sure that um, we're collecting and sharing with you all the research, building that common knowledge base and deciding what that means for how we move forward. Anyone else who has not yet spoken up who's got a thought here? Okay. So to Sally's point, Sally asked about the sort of statutory authority and how this work works. And so I wanna make sure that I, I do make that clear. I also want to use this as an opportunity to invite you all to, you know, in all your free time, given uh, how much free time I know you all have these days, um, <laughs> you can feel free to take a look at the, on the state board's website in our social studies section. We also have put all of the meeting notes from all of the social studies committee meetings. So the ones that the board internal committee has had, um, and you can see sort of the arc of our thinking there as well as some documents that have been shared for from previous state board meetings where we've focused on the social study standards. So there's one that I'll make sure we call out and send as a follow up doc to all of you. Um, that is a deck that OSI and SBOE presented and put together um, so that we could share what our process looks like of what SBOE is doing, what the advisory committee is doing, what SBOE is doing, what OSI is doing, what the advisory, it's basically got to laid out what this whole process looks like. So we'll make sure we send that to all of you. The state board has statutory authority to approve state standards. So this advisory committee is helping the state board say, here's what we want the new standards to look like, to say, to do, to include, how we want them framed and structured. ASI is responsible for writing the content of those standards. And thank you to my amazing, the amazing state board staff who is just magically putting all these documents I've referenced in the chat. Um, to Scott Abbott asked a great question. Yes, we will save this chat and we'll make the content of it available to folks. Um, the, the state board is gonna work with the advisory committee to come up with those guiding principles. ASI has the responsibility for writing the standards. They'll bring together a writing group. They will write the standards, bring those standards in draft form back to the advisory committee and the state board, bring them out for public input, uh, and then they'll bring them to the state board formally for the state board to vote to approve. 
I am incredibly proud to say that Aussie has been working as a collaborative partner with us on this effort, all the way from the inception of the idea that it was time to review the standards to the present. And I expect that that's going to continue throughout the process. So it's my great hope that when we get the standards to vote, we are at a set of standards that we have collaborated on and collectively agreed is the right set of standards. But it does fall to the state board to approve or deny the final standards. Um, so that that is the, the statute. Um, but it's my hope that we get through that all as a collaborative process. Any other questions on that before I move us on? We're doing really well on time for having these really rich conversations. And I'm just, I, I'm pleased to be with my people, my fellow social studies nerds. It makes me so happy. All right. So one thing that I don't want to belabor, but I'm certainly, if this is of interest, and I know that Scott pointed out, you know, there, there are ways that states have organized their standards that we definitely will dive into. But I just wanted to let you know that our process that we have created um, for how to do this state standards review and revision is sourced from what other states have done. So we looked at a number of other states that had revised standards recently and what their process looked like. And they varied in their process and approach, but they had sort of three big common components. One was broad stakeholder engagement throughout the process. So states did uh, online commenting, in-person engagement, comment opportunities, focus groups from parents, teachers, students, community members. And that's one thing that I want to make sure this group knows we're going to call on you to do. Um, and we'll talk more about that as we go through. Um, specifically, we're going to look for your support on how we best engage the public. Um, I am going to, I'm going to call out lovingly Laura Fuchs on this. I know that there's a lot of distrust in our city on how people are engaged and whether it is authentic. And Laura, you are always my most honest voice on this in our state board conversations on whether folks have been sort of good actors and honest brokers of requesting input and then meaningfully using it. Um, and so it is my hope that you all will do that for this process, that you will say to us as the state board, here's what it looks like to authentically engage with the public and get their feedback. Here's how people feel like they are being placated rather than actually engaged and asked for feedback. Um, so one thing I hope you'll all start thinking about now is how, does we, how do we do that? How do we make sure we're hearing from folks who often are not heard from in the feedback processes? How do we make sure that we hear from more than just the more than the two students we have on the advisory committee, but we get a broad cross section of student input? How do we hear from parents? How do we hear from educators? How do we really engage folks? So that's that's one piece that we are gonna look for you here to guide us on. Uh, a second is this expert advisory input. So we've brought you all together and we are incredibly impressed by your expertise. But one thing we also wanna make sure we're doing is hearing from you, who else do you wanna hear from? Who else is not part of this advisory committee, but might be a good speaker to bring or a person to share responses to specific questions that you all may have? Um, the, ex the outside research you're all referencing, I think, is part of that. But also, are there individuals you want to hear from? Are there thinkers uh, on this work of standards themselves or particular time periods in history or ways of thinking about, talking about, learning history that we should be hearing from? Um, so we're going to look for that. That's something we saw done in other states. Um, and then finally, this teacher-led standards writing. Um, in the states that we looked at, states definitely included outside experts for researching and facilitating the writing of standards. But many, many states and states whose processes I know members of the state board admired um, had writing committees that were primarily composed of school-based educators. Um, I know that Aussie shared uh, with the state board the work of writing the science assessment. The number of educators that had been involved in the writing of the science assessment for DC um, was significant. And when the educators came and spoke with the state board about their experience, it was clear how much it meant to the teachers to have been part of writing the assessment that went with the standards that their students were part of. So I'm hoping that in the writing of these standards, we can see the same kind of work repeated. Um, questions on these components of state standards revisions? Are you interested in 
been learning more about the states that we looked at. Again, I can point you to the notes from our committees. We looked at um, Michigan, Kentucky, Colorado, a couple of other states, but those are the ones we did deep dives on. Um, but if you'd like to know more, we can do that. And Scott, I can I can share the details of what we who we spoke with and what they shared. Laura, I like your reference back to the ESSA task force. Um, I'm going to count to you on Karen's good expertise in, in that work and the engagement. Other questions, comments on these, this process? There's a couple hands up. I'm not sure if they're new or old, Daniel and Fidal. Like maybe they're old. Okay. Sorry, that was old. That's okay. All right. So if there are no further questions on that, we're going to come back and talk deeply about engagement in meetings ahead. Right now, we've got that engagement process targeted for the fall. Given COVID, I have no idea what our world will look like this fall. Um, so I am at the moment thinking that all of these engagement opportunities will be virtual. Uh, but part of the reason I'm not going to spend more time on that now is I think we all have to wait and watch how the world develops to figure out how we actually implement the engagement. Um, but please keep the ideas coming on who we need to engage um, and how we think about things. Thank you, Molly, for the suggestions on um, experts from progressive education models. Okay, so I'm gonna move us then to next steps. I wanna make sure everyone has the meetings for the remainder of 2020 on their calendar. If when we go through those dates, if any of those are an issue, please go ahead and just send me a private note so that we can follow up in our one-on-one -on -one conversation um, and, and make sure that we can um, keep you an active participant in the meetings. I want to talk about the possibility of subcommittees. Um, Laura, you had raised that earlier, and I think given the expertise we have in this group, there are a couple ways we could think about affinity groups or subcommittees on this panel. And then finally, I want to let you know that Karen Williams and I are going to reach out to make sure that we each get a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, have a chance to talk with you all one-on-one -on -one and understand more about what you're hoping to get out of this work, how we can craft this work to make it meet and match the expectations of our experts. We may divide and conquer a little bit. Um, I don't want to speak for Karen, but I, when I spoke with her earlier today, we talked about her expertise really being in the early grades and in special education. I taught middle school. So we may divide and conquer based on your academic expertise or the areas you've uh, shared that you have great interest in. Let's go on to the meeting dates. So these are our calendared meetings for the rest of 2020. They are the second Tuesday of each month. They're all from 5 to 7 p.m. For now, please presume that they are virtual. If the world begins to open up again and in-person meetings are an option for us, we will make sure everyone has adequate notice, but for now we'll be meeting virtually through WebEx. Any questions or comments on the meeting dates? We try to be conscious of holidays and observations and other things, but if we have missed those, please do let us know. And thank you, everyone, in the chat for the other suggestions on who we reach out to and incorporate, um, as well as the, the point about sourcing information from grassroots activists to make sure that we're not missing the forest for the trees by not including all the voices. All right. So thoughts on subcommittees. What I am going to ask is that as we start this work together, that everyone read all the standards, because I really think it's important for all of us, especially as we've had this conversation about themes and through lines, to see what the full scope from K-12 looks like. 
But I do think that given your expertise and given the way we're talking about this, it will make sense at some point to divide and conquer. Two ways I thought that we might be able to do this are dividing by grade level or dividing by discipline or content strand. It's not the only way we can do it. What are folks' thoughts here? Would it make sense at some point to break into groups? Is one of these more appealing than the other? Should we do a combination? Molly votes yes on grade level. Other hands or comments or thoughts? Looks like we have a couple of yeses for grade levels. Um, I'm going to go to Becca. Becca, you might be on mute. Um, so I'll, I don't know anything about five-year-olds, but just thinking about in the middle school and high school, just based on what some things that have been said, it might make sense to put them together, like the world, like world and U.S., because there are some things that I think have both a middle school and a high school standard. So some hybrid might make sense. Great. Thank you, Becca. Reggie? Yes, ma'am. So as I've been listening to the conversation, I've really kind of drawn to this more holistic approach where we're, we're thinking thematically. And I'm kind of looking at some of the comments in the chat. I, I, I really agree grade level might be appropriate later, but I think starting off with grade level might be kind of productive to look at thematically. Got it. Other thoughts? Looks like there's a lot of good discussion happening in the chat. So it doesn't feel like we've got a clear, a clear sense that one versus the other, but probably more some combination of the two, as well as some whole conversation to make sure that we don't miss that through line. And that we think about people's expertise and passion. Hey, Jessica, can I jump in? This is Elizabeth Warren. I've had my hand up. Oh, I'm so sorry, Elizabeth. I didn't see it up here. Please, no please worries. jump in. I was, I was trying to follow the rules. I just wanted to make a plug for starting with content or discipline. Um, in part, like my expertise is citizenship and civic education, and I can speak to that across grade levels. I so appreciated Fidel's comment very early in the conversation when he talked about how many standards are missing in civic education across grades. Um, so I would just like to make a plug for that to start with a content area. I think we could get really lost in the weeds, um, perhaps going grade level by grade level without thinking about overarching arcs and thematic. Um, thematic. Sorry, I'm losing my train of thought, but you know what I mean. Thank you. Yeah, I do. And I see Jessica had put a good comment in the chat about um, perhaps organizing subcommittees by themes as they emerge. Do you want to say more about that, Jessica? And then I'm going to come to Melanie. Um, somebody referenced the teaching for tolerance, social justice standards, and I was going to suggest those two. What I appreciate about them is they're divided in specific domains, like around um, identity, um, justice, action. And so I wonder if we could, in our subcommittees, look at specific themes across content area and across grade band that connect to specific themes around what we want, what and who we want students um, to know about so that we're not kind of reproducing what already exists. Um, again, in the spirit of honoring our commitment to being anti-racist, I think that's, I think this kind of linear approach is what presents the biggest challenge to the standards as they're currently written. Got it. Melanie, and then I'm going to call on some folks who had thoughts in the chat. I would just add that from our introductions, it seemed that most people even applied to this committee because they were more passionate about a discipline or a content area as opposed to a grade level. Um, so I feel like that's where we can put our strongest expertise in. It's for focusing on discipline or content. And I would agree with Reggie that maybe later on, 
grade level conversations would be useful, but to get this started strong, I feel like discipline makes more sense. Okay, thank you, Melanie. Um, Shalina, you had noted um, about your experience in the past. Do you wanna talk a little bit about how that worked to break up in grade level and then content level? Um, sure, uh, can you hear me? We can, it's okay, great. Good. So um, yeah, it, it was, we had maybe 200 to 250 teachers and other educators um, in the room, but we, we broke up by grade level first, and then from the grade levels, um, we went into content areas. But we were a little different because we actually infused the um, C3 standards in our revisement of the um, standards. So um, for instance, I focused on economics and I focused on civics and government because that's what I taught. Um, but I couldn't work with the elementary teachers because I didn't know anything about those standards or what should be taught in those grades. Um, and so we, our standards weren't quite broken down as far as DC standards are, as far as world history um, in certain grades, because we, our state gave the flexibility for uh, districts to decide what's taught and when is taught. So we didn't get that um, specific. So for high school, it was basically seven through 12. You're working on world history. You're working on US history like that. Um, so it's a little different from what we're proposing to do, but um, that's just an example. It worked for us, but this is a new day and time, a new state. Our students are totally different. So yeah, no, but, I um, but that was my experience from working with the revision. Thank you, Shalina. I do appreciate hearing sort of about how it went. And Emily, you also mentioned the C3 framework. So I'd love to just hear a little more from you on that. Um, well, I noticed in the comments, you know, or maybe it was out loud, I can't remember, but someone was saying that um, their concern was that, you know, history is prioritized, um, particularly in middle and high school, over other social sciences. Um, and I agree that that can be an issue with the way that we're approaching it right now. Um, but I liked that the C3 framework treats social studies as kind of a compilation of various social science disciplines as well as history, which kind of straddles the humanity social science divide there. And they look at each of the disciplines as having sort of unique ways of disciplinary thinking. So in economics, you know, you need to think like an economist in history, you think like a historian, and they kind of looked at like, what does that mean from, you know, early elementary up through um, high school. And what I appreciate about that is that it treats each discipline kind of in its own right. And I think supports kind of deeper thinking um, in them because of that. And so I don't know kind of the extent to which um, that's something, you know, you guys are thinking about right now, but that's when I was thinking about dividing it up. Um, I was wondering if that might be a way to kind of ensure the vertical alignment. And I think several people made this comment in the chat, ensure that this, this sort of thematic approach, these long arcs that uh, people want to emphasize are actually kind of honored from kindergarten through 12th grade. Barbara, you had a question here about Becca's comment that as we think about breaking this up, you said the discussion makes me think we're deciding what the standards are going to be. Say a little more about that. I think I've unmuted you. <laughs> Sorry, I had too many things open. No, I couldn't okay. find where I was. I knew that look. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't know that I can say a whole lot more. I mean, by asking us to um, consider uh, whether or not we want to be sort of uh, dive in, in into expectations by grade level or, or what the content would be in each of these dis di different um, content strands, it does seem to suggest, um, I guess the, the image that's kind of coming to my mind is that we are, um, you know, sort of becoming advocates for that, uh, for how that uh, the, the, those standards might be um, developed, and um, and I'm just still sort of trying to under try, try, trying to reflect on the the notion of guiding principles, and 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 so um, uh, I think I think we've got a lot of hard 
thinking to do about how we can signal to a writing team uh, what it should be doing relative to the, uh, it, it feels to me as though just, just having listened to the conversation that, um, that we run that risk of, of, of um, not staying at that elevation where we can give a writing team, particularly since we're gonna have the opportunity to react to uh, work that a writing team um, is it, it, it is going to be doing um, that uh, we would be digging into um, uh, fine points of content or 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 progression um, before we have really looked at how we can signal to a team that's going to be doing this tw you know twenty four seven because that's tricky stuff you know what those progressions are and what that content should be and if what the direction is to them look at you got to really whittle these these standards down because there's just too much and we've got to make some hard decisions within this content strand i mean th 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 that's the elevation that it feels to me that we should be looking at right now anyway and, and i just worry that we would be um putting the cart before the horse sort of by getting into these teams Yep. Nope. I appreciate, I appreciate all that. I also appreciate the thread that Sally started that others have joined in on, on, um, and I, I agree. I think this goes back to one of our norms of, um, accepting non-closure. I don't think we have to decide right now on this. Um, but I am glad that we heard all sorts of takes on the possibilities. Um, because I do think that re reading the standards itself themselves rather would make makes the most sense to make sure that everyone has had a chance to have the same sort of time frame to review the standards. I've also suggested some guiding questions. We're going to go there next, um, but I'm open to being told that we need them to be different guiding questions because what I'd like to do before the next meeting is, is this. The pre-work for August 11th that we're asking folks to do is to read the DC social studies standards in their entirety. Um, they're in the chat again because our staff is magic and they've just put them there um, and you should have received them in your email so you've got them um, these are the guiding questions that the state board members used to look for and think about as we read they may not be the right questions and if I were writing them right now on the spot I think I'd ask some different ones because of the feedback you all have offered during the, the content today so take a minute, look at those questions. Let's decide together on the right ones. Because what I'm gonna do before August 11th is send you all a Google Forms survey and ask you to share your reflections on the guiding questions so that I can compile them and give them back to you all and say, here's what you all said in your reflections so that that's our starting point for our August 11th discussion. Um, is you read the standards, you wrote down your reflections, we compile them for folks and we can start with some sort of collective reflection. What should we be asking if not these questions? Or are these the right ones? Molly? Um, I just want to loop it back to um, Fadal's point about the cognitive lift. I think we can, these are great for content, but we could add a cognitive thinking question around like, um, I don't know, is the cognitive lift developmentally appropriate? I think in younger grades, the answer is no. <laughs> Something to reflect on. Thank you. Other thoughts on that? Nick, you've got a point about what currently promotes civic engagement. Dispositions and skills. Vidal? Yeah, I was actually going to hit right on the skills point. Um, we should be talking about like what skills do we want to address uh, through, via historical thinking, critical thinking, um, 
uh, the the standards actually do, aren't too comprehensive when it comes to those types of skills, um, especially through middle and high school. So I think that's something we should really should be thinking about because if our students don't have the actual skills to deal with these standards and like this and all of these um, facts that we're throwing at them, like it's, it's all for naught essentially. Um, so I think that's that's pretty important. Thanks, Fidal. Melanie, is this a hand up for this? Um, you know what? I meant to lower that. I had a question earlier, but it's okay. You sure? Yeah, I'm okay. Thank you. Okay. I'll put it down. So it looks like there's a um, Molly France. I think another thing is um, uh, something around synthesis. How did the standards um, lead to any sort of synthesis around themes and content? Jessica, thanks for that point about adding in this statement around how are the standards, how and where are the standards anti-racist as well as culturally relevant. I'm going to take the suggestions here in the chat. I'm going to add them and in the case of a couple of these, revise them to uh, this list here and send it as a follow up to all of you. And in my survey that I send to all of you, I'm going to list all of the questions, but I'm going to make them, for those of you who are familiar with creating Google Forms, I'm going to make them all optional, none of them required, so that if there are questions you want to dive deep on and others that you skim more on, you're just sharing the reflections that really stand out to you from this broad list of questions. Um, and that way we'll have that as a collective um, exercise and a collective set of responses before we meet on the 11th. Are there any other questions that are burning for you that you did not get a chance to ask or have addressed tonight that you want to make sure we use the last two minutes and 40 seconds of our time together to air? Fidel, is that a new hand? Oh, there we go. Is there a way for the group to communicate outside of meetings? That's a great question. Um, so I think right now uh, we've got the share site where documents will be. We don't have any sort of um, sort of discussion forum, um, but we can certainly make sure that everyone has one another's email address. Um, if anyone's got a suggestion on how to make sure or how to provide an opportunity for folks to do that. We could create a Google group. We could do um, a WhatsApp chat. I think there's a number of ways we can do it. So if you have ideas, go ahead and send them um, my way. Um, and thank you again to our amazing staff. If there's anyone who does not want their email shared or you want a different email used for this work than the one that, that you've received documents from us already, please let us know that. But if you've got ideas on how to do this, Google group or chat of some sort, um, send them our way and we will figure that out. Because I do think, um, I think it'd be great to have the chance to chat with each other in between meetings. I also cannot even um, imagine the brilliance that all of y'all are going to share with each other and what's going to come of it outside of this particular work. Sounds like that's two votes for a Google group. So we'll start with exploring that and see what else comes up. So I want to end on this note. Thank you all for a wonderful first meeting. Thank you again for volunteering your time to be part of this work. We are going to follow up with everyone with information and resources that folks shared in the chat. I'm gonna follow up with folks I took notes on specifically who offered uh, information they wanna share on research we should be looking at, at groups and experts they wanna make sure we engage over the next six months. Um, and we'll follow up with you with the reflection questions so that you have those. Um, and we will look forward to seeing folks on the 11th. Karen and I are also going to reach out for these individual one-on-one -on -one conversations. So if learning questions come up between now and then, um, please feel free to reach out to either of us. We'll share our emails with you all in our follow-up. Thank you so much. Excited to meet you all. Have a wonderful evening. And we'll see you Thank tomorrow. you, Jessica and group. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.